So I'm back to finish the lesson that I started two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Two, we have a two week break. So to review, I put some of the stuff up here. It's really quick. We got through the Old Testament and um, just a reminder, we're talking about women and what the Bible says about women. Um, so we started in the Old Testament. We started with Adam and Eve and learned that God created them and asked them to rule the earth together um, and that he made them as a complement. Those were kind of two of the... So at least for me, those were two things that I thought um, were significant about the creation of Adam and Eve as far as women. Um, in Exodus, Judges, Second Kings, we learned about some of the other women in the Bible. Miriam was a thing. I can't spell this one. She was a prophetess. Deborah was and yep, she was both. And <laughs> Yeah, she kind of wore several hats. We could also call her a general, maybe. <laughs> um, she led the military. Hulda was a prophetess. And then we also read the Proverbs 31 woman. And what do we learn about the Proverbs 31 woman? She's what? Business. She's a businesswoman. She's not just she's an importer and an exporter. Yeah. <laughs> she imports, she exports. She's also a wife. She cares, for, which means she cares for her home. Also said that she bought and sold property. Um, she worked from sunup to sundown. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. So, right. So you like, you assume that she's also a mother, and she's managing household of you know multiple people. Then, when we spent time in Genesis, we also talked about the sin that occurred and the curse. The curse for him in general was <laughs> weeds. <laughs> Specifically the sweat of his brow, right? For her, we get as women pain in childbirth. And Increase. <laughs> I like the way you see that. And your your <laughs> demonstration. Uh, we will <laughs> butt heads <laughs> with our husbands, with men. Well, that's kind of our curse. So the other thing before we move into the New Testament, just as a reminder. The Old Testament for us as New Testament saints is meant to be what? Okay, information. Specifically about what? God. Yes, thank you. And God's what? Character. According to God's character, how did he treat women in the Old Testament? <laughs> better than other countries the same as men um because there were men that were prophets there were women that were prophetesses now the only thing that i can think of in the old testament that did not happen for women was a woman never held the ultimate if you want to call it that position of queen 
no there was one or that or priest exactly so there was no priests that were women there were no queens now to some degree you could argue with that because esther there was esther however even esther didn't have the power that we think of as a queen because even she had to submit to her king um she risked the her life literally to even ask to go before him when she did right I and mean, he could have said no nope, off with your head <laughs> um but she risked that for her people anyway so um i found that interesting just you know so the old testament also we had this the sin and because of sin we were given the law And the law was for what? To show, to show a man's sinfulness. Okay. And then we come to the New Testament. Now we're going to take a look at what the New Testament says about women. And as we go through, I want you to keep in mind, one, God's character. And then the whole story of the New Testament. The whole story of the New Testament is what? Right, and we now have, we don't have the law anymore. We have grace. And with that comes the wonderful picture that we all are familiar with, but I'm not going to do nearly the justice that Josh and, <laughs> and Tim do to it. <laughs> but as believers, all of us, men and women, when we are saved, we are right and i think that all of that needs to be remembered as we look at these verses and what the new testament says about women because it's in the new testament when we get down to a couple of these verses where um that's where the question comes in of where you get the split the division in the churches where you know you have the extreme side of women can't even pray in church and really shouldn't even speak and need to wear head coverings and should still wear dresses and long hair and you know all the the rules about women to the ex other extreme where some think that it's okay for a woman to be a pastor and so we have those extremes and we're going to kind of take a look at some of that not in the same and as far as tim is but <laughs> we'll look at some of it so we're going to start in luke so luke 2 36 through 38 then we'll start with you today if that's okay, okay. now there was one anna a prophetess the daughter of whatever of the tribe of Asher, she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Keep going. Nope, that's good. So Anna was a prophetess. Okay. So even here we have another prophetess. Um and um she was a widow, so she had been married. I thought that was interesting. Um and but she was and in this case, um I know I've always found her it was she's one of those people that it would be really interesting to have known more about her like she did serve at the temple she yeah priest. She no she served. served at the temple exactly and I've always wondered what exactly that meant because um she served at the temple and she served it for a long time and prayers she widow for and she was a yeah she was a widow for 84 years and if they i mean the indication is that whole 84 years she served at the temple okay put the map to this how old is this lady yeah you know did she marry at 14 or 20 <laughs> and then you added seven years and then a widow yeah yeah i she's know quite she's quite old and she's still there serving um She's 84 and go, oh, 84. No, she's, yeah, she's, she's 90 plus. Or it may be even, or, or over 100. Exactly. Yeah, I know. 
because you don't know when she got married so yeah it's an interesting well i read that as that she was 84 he lived for the little widow to the age of 84. And of about 84 years. Huh? Yeah, and it could be, yeah. I mean, it says she lived seven years with her husband, mm -hmm. but that she was 80. So it doesn't tell us when she got married. She mm -hmm. got married later, mm -hmm. lived with them seven years, and then, but it doesn't look like that she was a widow. Yeah. I think you could read it both ways. Not that it really matters either way. The key point here is that she was a prophetess. Um, and so even as we're moving into and she's um <clears throat> here with Jesus, right? um so now let's take a look at acts we're going to jump to acts 21 9 Gary, if you could read that when you get there. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied yep. while we were one of them. Yeah, you can, that's all. We can stop there. Um, so here's a gentleman. Um, and if Basically, this is, um, they were in Caesarea, the house of Philip, and so Philip had four daughters who prophesied, and so here we have prior to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and after, we still have some women who are prophetesses. And they are prophesying. Let's go to First Corinthians eleven, four through five. First Corinthians four. Oh no, eleven. Sorry, eleven four through five. Leslie. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. So we're not going to worry about the head covering piece of this because <laughs> that's a whole nother <laughs> um, discussion. The point I want to bring is that we still have men and women prophesying. It's not saying that women shouldn't, saying if they do, this is a little bit of direction around. So again, they're still being treated equally as men, correct? There's not, there's not any distinctions here. Um, so Essentially, women have the same roles as men during this time. Let's go to Galatians 3.27 and see what that says. Honey, Galatians three twenty seven mm -hmm. and twenty eight, please. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
So what is this telling us? In Christ. Everybody's the same in Christ. <clears throat> to the extent there is neither male nor female. So that doesn't say our gender disappears. <laughs> what? <laughs> As some would like you to believe today. Um, but in Christ means but, up in heaven. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I would say that this is also just talking about that um, it's, it's, it's the way God sees us. God doesn't see our color. He doesn't see our race. He doesn't see gender differences. What he sees, Ronnie? Well, I was just going to say, it, I agree with you there, but also it's how um, God wants us to view each other. Exactly. So another, you know, people in the church should not think themselves higher because they're a man or a woman because they should be themselves as equal in Christ. And same with the racism. I think that's the key point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This is what you just said. It's that it's not that we don't recognize race and that we don't recognize gender and that we don't recognize all these distinctions we have down here. The point is that none of those distinctions make us better than another. Right. Our status is equal. Yep. Because in God's eyes, we're equal in our sin. <laughs> <laughs> where once we are in Christ, we're equal in our righteousness, and that righteousness covers everything, right? That's the whole point. That's why I said that I think we have to keep in mind that we all started here as sinners, and if we're in Christ, that's the overarching theme that has to be remembered when we're talking about this issue of how women should be treated. And how women should treat men. And how women should treat men. Way. Yep, it goes both ways. Just change your way of living and how you direct your thoughts and activities towards other women. And that whether that is a husband-wife relationship or a leadership role or general relationships, regardless, exactly. All right, let's take a look. So we're gonna, we're gonna, that was our positive. Okay, so we've got to start positive, right? That's the good news. That's the, the, the verse that, yes. Now, we're gonna take a look at the negative verses that people use, um, like I said, to um, essentially silence women in churches. There are, like I said, there are churches where women are not allowed to even pray, much less, sit here like I am teaching. <laughs> so let's take a look at 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Okay. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Okay. So, at face value, what is this telling us? There's times that the woman needs to be silent and know her place. Okay. That's that's the nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say how long it goes to walk two steps behind her whenever they place in public. No, it does not. <laughs> it's not that specific. No. <laughs> well, I'm against it or negative because God instructs both male and female to submit and everybody on the bottom right. to submit to one another. So I don't see that as a negative instruction. Mm -hmm. An important thing here doesn't say make the woman to be. It says let mm -hmm. her be. Mm -hmm. it, it, she's never made to be. It's that individual one taking this instruction and acting or not doing it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has at times not been silent. Yeah. yeah. And what you guys are both doing already is using the context of other verses that we know, right? We we have Ephesians, which we're going to look at, that tells us that we are to be submissive to one another. Um, but what happens 
as we know with so many verses is people pull one verse, pull it up and say, look, <laughs> this is what it says. Now, one thing to keep in mind um, that when you translate this from the Greek, um, the tra tranquil is actually for silence and it's turn over instead of permit. And so it reads a little bit more like this. And this is me taking the Greek in, okay? So a woman in quietness must learn with all submission to teach, but a woman not permit or to exercise authority over a man, but to be in quietness. So that's the literal English translation of the Greek using the Greek. Mm -hmm. Quietness, a woman in... Starting 11, a woman in quietness must learn with all submission to teach, but a woman not permit or to exercise authority over a man, but to be in quietness. No, where my quietness is done, the one who is, one who is not comfortable with me arguing or debating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I did a little bit of kind of um, background research on um, a couple of these verses. And um, part of what was happening in the churches was um, it was, and, and we're talking, and not just in the churches, but I'm talking like societal. So societally, it had become more prevalent for women um, because of the Greek um, religions, women were becoming much more vocal and a part of. So keeping in mind um, that in the Greek churches, there was a lot of sex <laughs> and stuff going on in the churches. That was just a part of what it was. And so um, there are some scholars that feel that that was part of what these verses were speaking against was just like any other time, some of that outside influence was coming into the churches. And so they were having to teach against that. So that's just kind of a side note that, you know, sometimes it's helpful to understand the context of what was going on in general in these communities. So, which takes us to 1 Corinthians 14. And did you, did you look at verse uh, 15 at all of um, chapter 2? She will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with good judgment. I did not. I mean, I, I did, but um, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> You because about uh, the culture in the area of the people he's writing to is, is Ephesus and mm -hmm. what temple is there? The temple of Diana. The, yeah. And so there's also a huge, probably inordinate, unbalanced uh, admiration for a woman a who woman. is seen as a god. Right. Okay. So, you know, does that affect the general populace? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And because in Ephesus it was Diana and then in Corinth, they had the, um, what was that temple? It was Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah. And it was the same kind of situation. So, um, so let's, let's go to, um, first Corinthians 14, three and the background, as we know, with Corinth, it was, <laughs> I wrote, it was a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> And because, remember, we're talking about some followed Apollos, Peter, Paul, we have that whole conversation. People were asking about divorce. Others were falling back into old lifestyles due to the influence of culture. And there was pagan worship of Aphrodite, um, which involved, again, prostitutes and the temple. So there was a lot of things that Paul was addressing um, in Corinth. So 1 Corinthians 14, 3, to begin with. So, Dad. On the other hand, one can prophesy a fate to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. 
Yeah, please. That two or three files that speak and that the editor is waiting for the said if a if a revelation is made to an editor sitting there let the first be silent so you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be assured and if there is a prophet such a the prophet for God is not a God of confusion but of peace and as in all the churches in the in the same. The women should keep silent in the churches, so they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is any, if if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home in the quarters, and thank the poor woman to speak in the church. Okay, so the the negative portion of this, I was going to reread the 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 part that gets pulled out and used. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Okay, now I had us read three to give us a little bit of context and 29 through 35, again, to get more of the context. So... What's the context here? Right. Yeah. Which is what? What? What is allowable and not allowable if we're talking about speaking in tongues? Just having a free for all. Exactly. There, because there's what's the purpose then? Verse twenty-two. The tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. That's so. If you're trying to speak tongues within the church, where you're saying about everyone there, you're unbelievers. Exactly. And then prophesying is for believers. Right. Right. So here we have again the situation. It appears and was that there was kind of chaos within the church. There were people speaking in tongues who should have not been speaking in tongues, and there was prophesying going on when prophesying should not have been going on. And so he's trying to bring order back into the church. Now, we already have proven over and over that women could prophesy. So it's not, he's not saying that if, it's, if a woman's a prophet, she can't prophesy. He's saying, if it's a woman, whether a woman or man, you need to do it in the right order and with the right I don't want to say rules, but speaking in tongues, you weren't supposed to speak in tongues if there wasn't somebody available to interpret, right? There, there had to be somebody who could, somebody, it had to be something that people were hearing and, and understanding. Yeah, if there was no it interpreter, would, then it, the man was supposed to be quiet too. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just the woman that needed to be quiet. The man needed to be quiet. It didn't matter who you were, if there was no interpreter, you don't speak in tongues. <laughs> Period. <laughs> in context, it seems like the women were being told because they were the ones speaking out. Of because they were speaking out of turn. Exactly. That would be the understanding in this context. So it's not saying a flat, nobody, no women can ever talk. <laughs> this is just giving guidance to a situation that was happening in that church. And an interesting thing too, when it says let your woman keep silent, unlike Timothy, this is the uh, be silent word. This it, it has to seem to have to do with this prophesying. Mm -hmm. And then yet you have the uh, daughters of Philip over in the other place that were prophesying. They weren't at church. And these one, and there was obviously something not appropriate here, though it wasn't edifying. Right. And uh, what's interesting too over there with Philip, those girls are uh prophesying in regard to Paul, remember? Mm -hmm. Paul's like a, on a mission to go to Jerusalem, and they're saying, you know, you should be doing this. <laughs> they're they're telling the, the 
mm -hmm. the steward of the dispensation what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not it's not their authority, it's coming from God. You know, so it, it's really irregardless of male and female at that point. It's coming from God. Right. Yep. And in 1435, just an, a point, the word ask means to ask between equals. So there's, in I'm, you know, <laughs> I know this much about Greek because it's, you know, what Tim and Josh have, and, and Jim have taught us. <laughs> but I do know that, um, when I read that, then that means that there must have been in the Greek an ask that meant not between equals. Mm -hmm. And so, but in this case, when it says ask the husband, it's not saying you're this, you know, less than person that needs to ask the more knowledgeable, powerful man. It is you're asking as equals. First Corinthians 11, 11, where it says, Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. Yep. So it goes back to that. Yep, exactly. I think it's interesting, too, that in verse 28, it says, If there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. But then it goes on and clarifies that in 39, do not forbid to speak in tongues just only a couple of times if there's an interpreter right so it's really yeah, yeah. exactly if you if you look at it in context <laughs> it's clear and the overall restrictions are there in verse 40 is for the purpose of being decent be you know in a outwardly appealing manner it doesn't look like it's chaos mm -hmm. and it has an order to it yep. and so edification has good appearance and is orderly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have a question on that verse 34. Is that silent? Silent? Women should remain silent in all the churches. They are not allowed to speak. No, I think that's in reference to the prophesying. Up in verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not. Not of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches, the same. And then it talks about the women. Mm -hmm. So I think it's talking about women who prophesy specifically. So, so in all the churches, they were not to prophesy during church time. Correct. Just the women. Yep. There any reason for that? Not no specifically, but um, they did prophesy at home evidently and then it was taken to the church probably by the man by the man yeah that would be my understanding as well okay it's a material now because of the prophecy you've ended so <laughs> yep yeah. although in the tribulation prophesying it'll come back it'll, it'll come, come back. back yep <laughs> it'll come back which is a really neat thing in acts two because it quotes Joel there, and uh, it's okay. I don't need that guy. No. But you go to Acts two, and you read. Um, see if I get this right. I hope I don't embarrass myself here. Is it just off the top of my head? Um, Acts two, in verse uh, verse sixteen, it says, "But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel," and then that this goes back to this the thing. He's talking about the spirit and whatnot. Verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay. That's not talking about that, that moment. It's talking about a future but the similarity is the coming of the spirit okay that's the that's the it, it, the old testament prophesied the spirit would come and here that gives validation to the spirits coming right now but there's going to be the spirit coming in the future and it, this isn't it but it's that same spirit you know 
So it's kind of a neat because, little because there it's, it's all flesh. Yeah, and it there it's, it's only hundred twenty. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's kind of a cool thing there. Um, anyway, thank you. All right. Well, while we're in Acts, let's go to Acts eighteen twenty four and through twenty six. <laughs> Mom. Now a Jew named Apollos in Alexandria by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Okay. So who do we have here? Husband and wife. Who knows which is which? <laughs> I've always assumed that, but you know, then, then there was a, I asked this a while ago, you know, because like in Spanish, right? When it ends in A, it's a female. And if it's an O, it's a male. Well, but it's Aquila and Priscilla. Well, <laughs> we assume Priscilla because a Priscilla is an you know an English female name, but maybe it wasn't in the Greek. Maybe Aquila was the female. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else knows or not, but we know their husband and wife, and they are a they're a team. Yes, they're a team, and together they are doing what. They're teaching and instructing. And in this case, they are not just teaching and instruction, but they're evangelizing. Would you go so far as to say that they're evangelizing? Yeah, I would because they're telling them about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Exactly. Yeah. And he doesn't know that yet. So here's a female who has one of those gifts. We're not sure which one she has, and her husband obviously has one of those. Maybe they both have the same gift, but um, that's what they're doing. They're working as a team in relationship. They're a team in relationship to each other, and they're in relationship with Christ. Okay. So let's take a look then at Ephesians 5. Most of you probably know what this is. So. Something else in that passage, passage is they took him aside and explained, you know, some things to him. They didn't mm -hmm. just like write out where he was just trying to. Yeah, yeah. They, right. They took him aside and yeah, yeah. yeah. Lindsay? Could you read, um, let's do 22 and 25 first, and then we'll go back to 21. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And then jump to 25. Yeah. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So here we have instruction to both. And it basically is. Submit equally, right? They relate to each other. So if we go back and read 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah. So all together, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So, again, 
if we put it all together from Adam and Eve <laughs> to the end, what's the actual message? Men and women are equal. Adam and Eve were created equal. They sinned equally. They were given roles, right? But this led eventually to the law. Then Christ came. We have salvation. And this, again, makes us equal in him. Um, another thing that I, uh, Jesus Christ is equal to the Father, but he submits to the mm -hmm. Father. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's good enough for the God of the universe to be able to submit to someone, who are we to say that we're too high and mighty to have to submit to crazy thoughts? Yep. And submission. Just remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Now stop your feet. <laughs> well timed, Gary. Well timed. <laughs> I, th I think there's need a little bit of moderation on, yes, we're equal. And you see that from the beginning. But on the flip side, they recognize there's differences too. Right. And each have their areas generally that they're better at than the other, right? And that's why I come back to, yeah, that's why I think right. this word is so important to remember. Because if we were completely equal, we'd be useless as a team. You need the differences. You need the strengths and the weaknesses because that's how you complement each other. I mean, what's the key point? God is in charge. <laughs> and so when one of them are carnal, the, what is the uh, spiritual? They may say something, but they may keep their mouth shut and go, well, you're disagreeing with God and leave it there. Mm -hmm. You know, but you're not supposed to argue with someone that's being carnal. You know, so it's you speak up but you're not arguing right it's a, a difference you know. exactly well and that that was what i was going to say too is a lot of people i think part of what happens is we misuse the word submit submit does not exactly it doesn't mean you're a doormat it doesn't mean that this person has ultimate power over you <laughs> It just means that. <laughs> well, the key part is the first part over in Ephesians, it says God is over the church, man over the woman. But God is also, since over the church, God is also over man. So there's just progression of mm -hmm. the way, you know, there's they're equal, but they have. They're there's apart. order. Different order. The, um, the word submission, uh, I think it's uh, Steve Adams, he, he often, uh, I've heard him illustrate it with uh, the concept of in a military where this word for submission is used in a lot of military usages. And uh, it's the idea that you're re coming under another for a common benefit. Right. And uh, even if you look in the military, it, it's a matter of order. It's not a matter of they're better than you. You know, it's a matter of authority. And it's not that they're better than you were higher than you. Were. No, and, so that's always an interesting illustration. Yeah, and I have been told by someone who's an officer in the military that um, in many cases they're encouraged to bring the arguments because that's how they hear the advice. Mm -hmm. It's just that once the person in charge makes the determination then everybody else has to fall into line for the good of the oh i don't agree with him i'm not going to do that you know yep. i'm not going to go fight this when i don't agree with him i find it really ironic uh is i the way I, this could be my opinion so take with a grain of salt like that i find it interesting that through the bible women were before probably the new testament uh, women were considered kind of possessions and 
through the New Testament, you have verses like Galatians. There's no difference between male and female. Women are elevated, right? And uh, I'd really argue that the women's lib movement pulled a lot of verses like that to support their cause. And, uh, and but now the way the women's feminist movement has gone, I think they've hurt themselves. We've got our whole society is hurt because we don't have strong families. We we have this 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 argument between men and women. It's my career is the most important. No, my career is one. And now they're not a unit going forward. It's this uh, they're they're battling one another mm -hmm. about who's the breadwinner and who's this thing. Not that a woman can't work. Not a woman. That, I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying it's overall hurt our society. You know, not that we're trying to fix the world, but this is just my my impression. You know, um, and it promotes an attitude of independence. Yeah, each other. Right? You don't. I don't need you. I don't need to cook back. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I like that, that it does, I would agree, it does promote this idea of independence that, um, especially for women, that women don't need men, and um, men have I, their, own, I, their own problems that have resulted from all of this, mm -hmm. you know, probably the breakdown, in my opinion, breakdown of the family, biggest problem in our society, mm -hmm. and uh, I agree. <laughs> And part of, I mean, one of the reasons Tim wanted to do this was for the young people in the church. And I think this kind of leads to what I kind of wanted to end with if I had time was, how does this apply to everyday life? I mean, okay, we've looked at what it means. Okay, we, we can agree that it doesn't mean that women can't speak in church. Um, I think, you know, I would agree. I don't think that a woman should be a pastor. I do think that that is kind of a, you know, a role that needs to stay with men. That I think it's okay for. I'm obviously I'm up here teaching, <laughs> so obviously I think it's okay for me to to be given this opportunity by my pastor to teach. You know, um, and I, I'm not afraid to say that he gave. You know, he gave me the beginnings. I took this and I added to it, and you know, um, but. How does that apply then for our young people to, you know, marriage and, and looking into the future? And and I would say the one thing that I would want to say is that I think it's important that for the girls, you just remember that one, this is why it's so important. And for the boys too, either way, this is why it's so important as a believer, if you are a believer, that you marry a believer <laughs> because that foundation is going to make that submission to each other possible and so much easier than if you don't have that commonality. And I am speaking from experience, <laughs> um, having had two failed relationships where that was not there. And so, um, that is probably the biggest piece of advice I could give to, you know, out of this is it's extremely important. That is a foundation that cannot be ignored. And if that means that you have to wait until you're 30 plus years old or whatever, oh, well, you know, you wait until God puts that person in your life. That's the right person. Don't rush it. Um, and at the same time, when it just comes to life in general, let God lead you to whatever, you know, I think it, this applies to careers and everything, you know, um, but along with what Josh said, I think that the breakdown of the family is a big part of the problem in our world and society today, and um, don't be afraid to, to stand firm and say family is more important than my career and making lots of money and you know all the things that people are supposed to say so that's my two cents anybody else want to add <laughs> this, this passage in Ephesians which is always a, a, a big attention getter about submission to each other uh, 
it, it's got to be remembered that it's under the context of Ephesians 5 18 being filled by the Spirit and submitting to God's authority. So, whether you're a woman submitting to a man, man submitting to a woman, uh, both are supposed to be submitting to God's authority, uh, using the parts of the fruit of the Spirit, part of which is faith, faith that God is going to uh, mature us in the way and the timing that He sees fit if we're submitting to His authority. And if we don't have all the answers, uh, if, if we're submitting to his authority, we're going to be getting the answers as we need them, and we're going to be growing and maturing together in harmony with each other as a couple, uh, rather than at odds with each other. Yeah, exactly. It, it all, I mean, that's, that's why I said, so I, I put this picture back up here, because it, it all comes back to that, it really does, and it's, and even with that, it's not just submission, you know, husband and wife it, you know the verse is very clear that you know he goes on and says the slave is to be submissive to his master and you know we're to be submissive to the government children we're supposed to children to their parents and you know i mean it, it, it's 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 on and on and um all of that is important and i think even as we're looking into the future again you know depending on um how you see the overall, um, I know my parents and I talk all the time and it's hard not to think that the end isn't coming pretty darn quickly based on some of the things that are happening, um, which means that, you know, even though we know that we're going to be raptured before the worst of it, that doesn't mean it's not going to get worse. And we as Christians aren't going to, um, even here in the United States, start to receive persecution. And um, I mean, I don't know if you guys heard this, but um, Israel is trying to pass a law where you can't, um, you, it would be punishable by death if you preach about Christ. Because Prime Minister said that would not pass. He, the Prime Minister said it would not pass. But, I know. You know but I the fact that they're it. trying, you know, I mean, there's more and more of those kinds of things that are they're trying to do, you know. And and so we mm -hmm. have to keep in mind that as much as we think we're safe in the United States, we may, we may you know, in our lifetime, we may not be, but we still have to be submissive. And Nope. So we, we know we're going to process that he's valuing all America for that. Yep. Yep. Nope. I agree. Um, so. I, uh, you talk about the kids today, 25 years ago, or 30 probably, 30 years ago, when Andrea was going to Big Ben, she had a professor assign her specifically to write on this passage in Ephesians. And if she believed, I don't know if he just gave the assignment to her because she, she was in a class about something, you know, you, they require you to take these classes about sociology and stuff like that. Anyway, I don't know if she said it and so he made her write it on this or if how it, if he gave that assignment to the whole class, but it was on the subjection of a wife to her husband and stuff. And she wrote about that it also said that the husband of the people, the believers were to submit to one another. And he said he'd never heard that before. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how much the, it's cherry picked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to find that something in the Bible that will, you know, get people up riled. And you know, so don't be surprised if you go to college and someone tries to get you a child about the Bible. <laughs> it's very common. Yes, it is very common. You're in good company. Mm -hmm. They hated Jesus, and they're not going to like you either. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know That's... what? I don't think you should be afraid of that because it'll send you to your Bible, and you'll say. What does this really say? That may be things that you aren't certain of. Mm -hmm. And it will make you firmer in your faith. So don't be afraid when someone is telling this to you. I agree. Thank you. Any other thoughts? We have a couple minutes. Any thoughts from the young people? 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is younger than me, so I guess that's allowable. <laughs> you have one. Non young people. No. Uh, no, just a challenge, I guess, to think like there's so many different ways you could have looked at women, you know, from scripture, and because we're not like compartmentalized. I mean, there's singleness, there is marriedness, there's there's ministry, there, there's just regular well, life, yeah. you know, and uh, and then I, so anyways, I was thinking kind of in marriedness, like, you know, what is our challenge then if we are to, if we complement each other um, to the Lord in, in ministry? When I use that word, I don't know, using it loosely, Right, but there there are things that Lindsay's and there are things we do together, and there are things we certainly don't do. Together. Mm -hmm. She does Wednesday uh, jam, which stands for. Um, you know, it's it's elementary kids. It's like it's like after school Bible club, right. and uh, you know she does that, which is super great. Uh, I'm doing Young Life, which is super great. She doesn't necessarily feel called to go. Like, yeah, I want to go meet with. Or, or like maybe that's not calling the right word, but kind of strong suit of sitting around and leading discussion with, with teens. Um, we went to Papua New Guinea. That was a joint effort. Uh, and we ran Awanas for a number of years, a joint effort. But yeah, it went, like what is the roles together? Because sometimes I think the perception is, like Jen could say, I'm married to Josh and he's a pastor. And I get drug along through all the pastoral lifestyle. I don't mean drug along. You know what I mean? But like, Tag along. Tag, yeah, I mean, and that is true. Like she is, she is the support and confident in that way. And, um, so those are thoughts that I have. Kind of back to and I agree because I mean, I, I um, having known several pastors' wives, I remember talking to one in particular that she was like, "I always feel like I have to act this certain way because I'm a pastor's wife." Yeah. And, and it's like, "Well, why?" What, what is there some description somewhere that says the role of pastor you know his wife must look like this you know you know has to play the piano and has to you know no you know why there's there's no right or wrong role and i would agree it's not you know being partner doesn't necessarily mean and compliment doesn't mean that you're lockstep in everything you do yeah. right it's um you're still individuals <laughs> and with but individual it's interests it's trust but, or mm -hmm. they're just they're pure agreeing with the economy or whatever because you there is whatever right but so i was just going to add that you know looking at your board your notes on the board and stuff and thinking about it that um in our society today, there are so many churches that operate under some kind of law. You know, they they incorporate in their version of the Ten Commandments or, or you know, whatever the, I forget how they word it, but, but they teach in Sunday school, Ten Commandments to the kids and, and the whole um, uh, law scenario. And and so as a young kid, I mean, we're seeing that going on more and more that um, when you are married, it's, it influences that because they're setting up this law, whether it's the Ten Commandments or their own, and not emphasizing the New Testament teaching in the church about grace you know, and about our position in Christ. And so um, it's, you, you can marry another Christian, but if they're immersed in a whole legal system, you know, from the, they grow up in the church that's immersed in that, there's going to be a lot of challenges as they learn right. how to deal with each other. And right. Well, exactly. And, and I, uh, I call that just, polyamic Christianity or puritanical Christianity. It's just another legalism. Yeah. And uh and it really goes back to what Jim said. It really comes back to being that 518. 
spirituality. Mm -hmm. You know, the Pollyanna Christian just goes, oh, it says do this, I do that, right? And I'm good, check, it's checked. I'm godly, right? But that's not all there is to it. There's an empowerment that goes before the submission mm -hmm. on both mm -hmm. sides in the, the world. Yeah, but that's not encouraged in all the churches. Not at all. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the churches, I would say, because so many of them go back to either the Ten Commandments or the Ten Commandments. Right. 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 So just one last, one last thought that struck me as I was doing this that I'm sure other people have noticed, but um so like just coming back to the beginning right here, what did the Bible start with? Adam and Eve and they were one to life. They were one flesh, they were married. Right? So also right. When we get to Revelation, what happens to us? We're neither married. No, but we are married. We're married to Christ. I don't I, in, in my research when I was doing this, it struck me, and then it just so happened I actually watched a whole video from Sean McDowell where he pointed the same thing out. And I just thought it was interesting that, you know, and again, going back to the young people, there's this push now to not get married. Yes. To just live together. But that's good enough. It's just a piece of paper. And and I would challenge that the same way Sean did. The Bible started with a marriage. He talks about marriage all the way through it. And it ends in a marriage with us marrying Christ. We're the bride and we marry him. Obviously, marriage is important to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that relationship is important. So just my final thought before we close. So, um, Jim, could you close this one? Father, well, we do thank you that you don't leave us to our own devices to try to come up with a logical and man's eyes view of how to live life and how to <clears throat> how to function in society. I mean, that's what unsaved man does, and that always leads to failure because of our sin nature. But you give us instruction. You tell us what honors you and how you want things done, and you give us the empowerment to do the very things that you want us to do. You give, give us the capacity to think your thoughts because of your spirit within us, because you're within us, giving us uh, your uh, spiritual DNA, as as we put it. We have Christ in us, giving us uh, his quality of life, and so we have all the capacity and grace that you've given to us to live life in a manner that is completely 100% honoring to you. It remains for us to be submissive to you and to do it the way you tell us to do it, using the power that you give us and relying upon you to provide the result. And this is uh, so that you receive glory. Amen. If anybody wants to see a picture of the temple and uh, in Corinth, I have a picture of the ruins. And it, I think it's kind of cool to scale. It's amazing.